Um, my name is Suzanne Wainwright. Um, I'm in a little different position than a lot of people in our, in our industry in that I am just completely independent consultant. Um, I took a pretty firm ground about, I guess, 13 or 14 years ago when I started my business. I wasn't going to sell any products because I learned very quick I'm a terrible salesperson. So um, I've worked throughout the industry, actually now just over 20 years, um, working with growers all throughout the United States, Canada. I've been doing more work down in the Caribbean, working on pest management programs um, and going in and helping um, fix issues, but it's, there's definitely been a focus on biocontrol. Um, I decided in middle school I was going to do this, so I was kind of predestined uh, to do this. So um, what I have seen is when I started, a long time ago down in Florida, there was a lot of door knocking on going to people and luckily there were a few growers down in Florida, um, actually Delray Plants, who Randy's here, um, and uh, there was uh, Butler's down in Homestead who really were interested in biocontrol back then and saw a need for it and actually I would say they let me be used their growing facilities almost as a playground to kind of learn how to use biocontrol because there wasn't a lot of information available. And even to this day, and I'm sure all you know, all you guys know, when you go to get information for biocontrols, like where do you go to get concise information? There's not really one good source out there. But from the flip side of me going to doors to, I'm pretty much working seven days a week now. Um, and I get on a plane almost every week. I'm glad my husband's in the industry or he would never see me. Um, but the, the growth in biocontrols, more insects, mites, beneficial nematodes, and fungi has just been going up and up and up. And we're seeing um, the biocontrol production facilities increase uh, production to meet demand of the industry. And we're still having shortage issues um, to meet the demand. Now, why this is happening, when my phone rings, the number one reason that people call me is because they cannot control a pest. It's never the warm, fuzzy, I care about the environment issue. It's I can't control it, get here now, fix it uh, kind of thing. And that still stands still. Now lately in the last two years, I've been getting more calls because the grower had just been told, okay, you've got to reduce neonics. And my job is not to be involved with the political end of it. My job then is just to help reduce neonics and how we can implement biocontrols and other uh, pesticides in there. Also, worker safety has become uh, more of an issue um, because uh, growers are concerned about exposure of their employees. And then runoff issue is another one because um, some of the customers I've dealt with, um, they are being checked on by their state about what is is running off or for some of the environmental certifications they are interested in what is coming out of the tailpipe of the nursery as I call it our greenhouse. Now what we're seeing how the people that are the most successful um, we're generally starting in one house kind of one crop. The mistake I think sometimes are made is people just come in and they just try to just change their whole growing operation too fast. You need to start very specific, very targeted on something we know we can control. Um, fungus gnats are one. Now, I always call fungus gnats because we use nematodes for this. I call nematodes the gateway drug to biocontrol. Because once you start using nematodes, you realize it can be done and you can be very successful and then move on to some of the more complex programs. But um, one of the ways things can go wrong is if you do have large houses and you pick one crop over here for bios, but then you're not doing on this one. If you come in and spray over here, and people are like, oh, no, no, there's no wind, there's no spray drift, there's spray drift. And with the technologies today where you can take a leaf off a plant and you can send it into the USDA and you can get your about five-page report to tell you parts per billion on fungicides, insecticides, and PGRs, you can really find out how much you're drifting. Um, and one of the focuses that I've seen changing finally is in propagation. Propagators are actually starting to look more at biocontrol. Um, because if you're a finished grower and you want to use bios, but you've just brought in liners that, dare I say, have been nuked with so many chemicals on them. Some of these chemistries, we're looking at two months before you can release, release biocontrol agents on them. So if the propagators are doing it at an earlier stage, that means when the Finnish people get their uh, liners or plugs or young plants, they're not coming with the pesticide residue, they're coming pre-inoculated with the beneficials, so it's easier to continue on that biocontrol program. 
It's, it's really the propagators need to even do more. And also, you're not getting insects arriving in on the plant material that already have insecticide resistance. Because Canada has done some great work showing that young plant material, the cuttings are coming in with you know, white fly eggs, they're coming in with thrip eggs, they're coming in with immature white flies. These cuttings are coming in with pests, and you know if you complain, they're just gonna spray more, which can create even bigger resistance issues. So working with propagation has become more and more of something that I've been seeing in the industry lately. Now, other trends that we're seeing is that we know that pests are not gonna be eradicated. Um, you know, 15, 20 years ago, growers loved to see when they'd come in with a pesticide and they loved to see the insects curl up and die and fall off a plant. I mean, they used to talk about how great that was. And I get the, well, I remember in the old days when we could come in with this chemistry. This eradication and these really hard chemicals, it's just not part of our future. You have to grow a clean plant with no damage. I mean, that's it. And you're not, you are not going to be able to eradicate western flower whips. You cannot eradicate spider mites. You need to suppress them to a level that the plant's good, it's sellable, and nobody complains. Um, conservation of beneficials, that's something people are asking me about more, which I think our industry has overlooked. Um, because those beneficials, the native ones, they are free workers for you. And something that happens quite often is I'm brought in because there's a problem and growers are spraying to kill beneficials. And those are free, again, free, no dollar signs attached, working for you. And so you really need to take time to get educated on those beneficials because what's happening is, is we're not using these broad spectrum chemistries anymore. More of these native beneficials are coming in and they are showing up in greenhouses even though they're buttoned up and sealed. Those beneficials will get in there. We're also seeing more banker plant systems being used to not only keep the beneficials you're buying happier in uh, your growing facility, but again, bring in some of the beneficials by attracting pollen. It's kind of hard to see in here because it's bright, but you know, here's a, a mums being grown and these are all banker plants that are being put out to provide pollen uh, to uh, one of our native species, aureus. And so the aureus who feed on thrips and spider mites and immature caterpillars, they can feed on the pollen here and then they'll go out and then they'll look for the pests and then come back. <coughs> And so this way, it's able to, you're able to not have to buy beneficials as often as well as attract in some of your native beneficials. And this growing facility here with this grower, um, they actually did uh, no insecticide applications on these mums for several years using this system. Um, and they actually marketed them that way. They would send out banners uh, to the garden centers like that. Um, other trends. Uh, rearing uh, their own. Um, this is something you briefly touched on. Um, I've had some of my customers um, rear their own predatory mites. Um, I have to say they go into it, but then how many growers need one more project? You know, that's what they I run into with that. Um, Dr. Lance Osborne has worked very hard to try to get growers to grow their own predatory mites. Out, growers just don't have time for one more project. And that's the reality of what I've seen happening there. I've seen more with more growers looking at doing their own nematodes. Um, but again, it, it, you've got to have somebody that can do it and has the time to do it um, out there. Um, uh, another thing that I'm seeing, talking about trends, is when I have been going to um, talk with gardeners um, or even talking to finish good people, they're asking who's growing the plants and how they're grown. And the gardeners are interested in who is growing biocontrol. I have made an effort this year to speak to a lot of master gardeners and a lot of garden clubs. Um, and I show them pictures of the amazing things that people like, you know, Delray Plants been doing, um, the, the changes that uh, growers have made to integrate more of these biocontrols. And they said, well, we want to buy from these people. We want to support these people. They have no way of knowing who these people are. Same thing with um, when you're growing the plants, if you're growing the liners. I've said for years, you need to let your Finnish people, you are using bios in your liner production because Finnish people are looking for growers that are growing. I see this in the interior scape industry. Um, they'll ask me what growers in Florida are growing with bios because they want to bring in uh, plants that have been grown with biocontrol agents so they'll continue working on the interior. Um, and another thing I'm seeing, I'm working a lot more with public gardens. Um, this is actually one of the projects I worked on with the Biltmore Estate. And there's a lady standing right there so you can see how tall this statue is. Um, 
because a lot of these public gardens are open 365 days a year. Kids are touching the plants, and they don't want to be they don't want to be seen out in in spray suits um, because of public perception. Um, but I've been working with more and more, and we're actually using a lot of biocontrol agents, releasing them outside um, on these uh, this, these particular living sculptures, but also just in the landscape. So we're doing a lot more of augmented biocontrol in the landscape, which um, people tend to think it can't be done, but I always say biocontrol started outside, so it's silly to think it wouldn't work outside. So um, some tips on the biocontrol stuff. I'll tell you, every program is different. I have never been able to take one of the programs I worked with and just print it out and hand it to another grower and say, here, make this work. You've got microclimates, you've got different pesticides, people have different ways of spraying, you have different pest complex, so it is not one size fits all. Um, you, you've got to learn um, how to make it work at your facility. Um, one of the guys from Syngenta always said it's like baking a cake. It's, you know, there's lots of ways to do it to end up still with a very good result, but there are lots of ways of doing it. The other thing, um, anytime you have uh, money, around a lot of people get involved um, and you have to make sure that you work with somebody that knows what they're doing everybody's selling biocontrol agents today make sure you work with somebody that knows what they're doing the biocontrol because I've seen a lot of wasted money and when I talk to people and they say oh biocontrol doesn't work you know I tried it and it failed and then ask what they do they weren't even doing the right thing or releasing the bi right biocontrol agent so make sure you work with somebody that does um, pesticides and impacting um, again, spray drift, pesticide residue on plants you brought in, pesticide drift from the farm field next to your nursery, or even if in a greenhouse, if it's getting sucked in through the air vents, that stuff can impact your program. So you got to understand how these pesticides um, impact beneficials. And you're seeing more the companies like BASF and Syngenta, they're testing their compounds against beneficials. I know that. Um, with the SS, pneumonicide to salt it, they've done a lot of screening and work with beneficials, so we know about compatibility issues there.